So hi everyone, I'm Megan McCarthy, editor of Africa Print. Thank you for joining us for Printing Essays webinar, which looks at the legislative regulations of the compliance with the Protection of Personal Information Act. Just some house rules. If you have a question for the panelists, please post these in the Q&A section. The chat is just for general banter, so please use the Q&A. And please also remember to take our polls in the poll section, which I will be launching shortly. So I'd just like to introduce our panelists, Safi Siddiqui, Senior Associate, Associate at Gunston Strandbeck, Kashifa Ali, Associate at Gunston Strandbeck, Zayed Vegas, Operations of Printing SF. So Zayed, I'll hand over to you. Hi, good morning, everybody, and thank you, um, Megan. Um, thank you to our presenters from uh, Gunston Strandvik Attorneys for availing themselves for this extremely important webinar, not only for our attendees on this webinar, but for us as Printing SA as well. Our members will know that we do not always have the expertise in-house to facilitate discussions around legislation, as it may fall outside of our ambit, however, we are mandated by, mandated by not only our members, but to a larger extent, all sectors of our industry. Uh, to be the go-to body for information that potentially has the ability to affect how we do business. That being said, we've invited an extremely reputable organization in Gunston Sandvik to impart their knowledge to us on this platform so that we can all be better equipped to understand the proper regulations that will ultimately affect us all for the foreseeable future. I will now hand over to Safi, who will take us through the presentation, and we invite you to please pose your questions on the platform, which we will address at the end, and please don't also forget to answer the poll. Thank you very much. Over to you, Safi. Thanks, Ed. Um, Megan, am I going to be sharing my screen now, or am I going to do a quick hello first? And um, what's up to you? Cool, so I just wanna introduce myself quickly. I, after Megan and Zayed's kind words, there's very little I can say to brag about myself that hasn't already been said, um, but I am a senior associate. I'm in a commercial litigation department. My colleague Kashif is in a commercial department. So we've got quite a breadth of experience between us. What we're now focusing on is data privacy, passions for both of us, um, extremely topical. And we are just trying to make sure that we get the word out there about Poppy because it's becoming a really big deal really quickly. At the end of my presentation, it says don't panic, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to act super fast. So I'm gonna just jump straight into the presentation. Um, and then we can go ahead. Go away screen. Cool. So this is me. I don't think we need to look at that now. We've spoken about myself, but I think, yeah. So to jump in, the first question that everybody who has not heard of poppy asks when they hear the word poppy is, what is poppy? It's not a flower. It's the Protection of Personal Information Act, and it deals exclusively with data protection in South Africa. It was enacted to get us onto the international standards of compliance. So it's heavily influenced by the European GDPR standards, and it sets out the conditions for lawful processing of personal information in South Africa. Um, whilst there are, you know, there are a number of considerations that apply and it's trying to give effect to the constitutional right to privacy, the main thing that we think it tackles um, relates to data breaches or what it refers to as security compromises, which are growing increasingly common. Um, you know, you've heard of them from Cambridge Analytica to Facebook and onwards. Um, data breaches have been causing significant trouble, not just in South Africa, but around the world. And compliance with Poppy, the idea of complying with Poppy is to firstly prevent these kinds of threats and issues from materializing, but also in the event that it does materialize, heaven forbid, to protect the organization whose data has been breached. So the compliance date was initially 1 July, 2020, um, but there has been a transitional period, which is now coming to an end. So everyone needs to become compliant with Poppy by 1 July, 2021. 
Um, if you want to know who poppy affects, the answer is pretty much everyone. And that's because firstly, everybody in the country has personal information and most businesses at the very least process personal information. Processing under the act has a really wide definition. It's everything and anything under the sun related to how you treat information that you have. So it's how you collect the information, how you store it, how you delete it, how you share it, who you share it with, what you do with it, how long you do that for, why you're doing it. It's all processing. And so there's no escaping poppy. You cannot obtain, especially as a business, you cannot obtain the data of a third party and say that poppy doesn't apply to you because you're not processing. No, that definition is so wide that it should just genuinely be called everything. Um, who does it affect exactly? There's, there's three people that you want to keep in mind when you're looking into the act, if you do your own research. It's the data subject. So the data subject is the person whose information is being processed. Then there's the responsible party, and that is the party that is actually processing the information and is mandated to process it. And then lastly, there's the operator. And the op if you're an operator or if you're employing an operator, what the operator does is processes personal information on behalf of a responsible party under a contract or a <clears throat> mandate. That one is, um, I think, of particular significance uh, to PSA clients because you guys get given information that by a responsible party in relation to possibly data subjects, and you're then asked to prepare this and prepare that and print this and print that, and that puts you in the position of operator. If you are collecting that information directly, so you're taking down someone's phone number, you're taking down their email address, then you're the responsible party for the, for the personal information. Um, we won't go into that into too much detail here because everybody still needs to comply and that is business specific where you land, but it's worth remembering that. The fourth, I guess, person, person that poppy affects is the information regulator. Um, that is the body that is in charge of ensuring that everybody is actually poppy compliant. Um, again, not, not strictly important, but it's your, it's your go-to. You know, if, if you're a small business or if you just don't want to spend money on lawyers and you can't find your answer on the internet, it's always great to contact the information regulator. Like many bodies in South Africa, they aren't perfect at the moment. They're still getting up. They're still getting running. Um, but from everything I've heard, they're super helpful. So it's a good place to start if you're not sure and if you don't want to contact a lawyer. Um, so I have broken PowerPoint rules and left this slide quite dense. And that's just because I want to illustrate exactly what personal information is. Um, so yeah, what is personal information? I mean, this is fairly important because everything that Poppy covers relates to personal information. There is no data to protect if that data is in personal information. So like I said, I've left this slide deliberately dense. Don't expect everyone to read everything on it and I'm not gonna read it all out for you, but it's deliberately dense so that you can just see the breadth of what constitutes personal information. In a nutshell, it is information relating to an identifiable living person and where it's applicable a juristic person or a company. Um, it includes everything from race, gender, marital status to your medical information, financial information, um, your name, your phone number, your address, your fingerprints, um, anything that can be used to identify you specifically as an individual is personal information. And that is what makes this so scary for so many people because you could be a hair salon owner in Ferenigung and <clears throat> sorry, you've only got 10 customers and you've got all their phone numbers, but suddenly you've got an attorney telling you, but Poppy is applicable to you because you've got their names, you've got their phone numbers, that constitutes personal information. And just by you writing it down and just by you keeping it at your hair salon, Poppy now becomes applicable. Can be, it, 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 again, like I'll say later on, and I've said before, it's not something to panic about, but it's definitely something to be 
aware of all of these things and where you have it you, you definitely need to start taking measures to comply um this one is this one is much shorter and deliberately so um because it's quite simple the test as to whether something is personal information is whether that thing can be used by itself to identify a person specifically so if you've got my cell number there are Rika records, you know, you can find me. If you've got a random email address without any name attached to it, um, monkey monkey 29 monkey monkey at hotmail.com. There is no way to, you know, it's not tied to my name. So you haven't taken my name down. You've just got that strange email address. That wouldn't be personal information because you cannot use that to trace me. At best, you know, if you're very clever, I'm not, but if you're very clever, you might be able to get it to root to an IP where I last logged in or so on, but you never know whose, um, whose computer it is. You never know whose IP address it is. So that would be something that isn't personal information. On the other hand, Safia Gunston, strandvic.com, it's very obvious that it's mine. So that will constitute personal information. The bottom line is that if you're not sure whether something is personal information or not, you'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, if it, if, if it's something that's not benign, so if it's more than an email address, more than a cell phone number, if it's something like a bank account number, if it's something that could cause harm to me, if it's, if it's leaked, um, for example, Safi's HIV status um, or Safi's STD test results, who knows whether, you know, whether I've got some kind of psychiatric disorder, that kind of information, first of all, is obviously personal, but that information is quite sensitive because if it's leaked, it can cause harm. So as we go along, I'll talk to you about assessing risk. Uh, but for now, the, the mantra that you want to keep in mind is if you're not sure about something, rather safe than sorry. Um, what we get to next is really the meat of Poppy. And this is the portion of the act that tells you what the conditions are for lawful processing of personal information. Um, the first one is kind of obvious it's accountability and um i'm just pulling up my act on my phone i promise i'm not being rude it's just so that i don't miss anything um but the first one is accountability and that tells you that you as a responsible party or whomever you are maybe the operator you must comply with eight conditions for processing um those eight conditions includes the first one so it's a bit it's a bit of a strange one but yes you you'll have to comply with eight of them the most important one is step number two, which is the processing limitation. In short, it says personal information should only be obtained um, by limited and lawful processing that does not unnecessarily infringe privacy. Um, so that, 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 it sounds like a short sentence, but there's a lot to unpack there. So number one, it must be obtained lawfully. So, uh, you know, you shouldn't be buying information from the black market. Um, you shouldn't be hacking into a database to get information belonging to someone else. That's, you know, that it, it sounds obvious, but, but that's essentially what it means for it to be lawful, in addition to the fact that it needs to comply with all of the conditions um, that are listed here. The next one is what we call minimality. That is where you minimize um, the information that you collect, judged by the purpose for which you're collecting the information. So if you're if printing SA is collecting my information so that they can let me know about webinars, and that's the only reason, and that's what they've said to me, they cannot then be using my personal information to, uh, I don't know, you know, to to sell me products because that's not what I that's not what I agreed to. That's a bit of a dicey one, but 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 you'll get the picture. It's what is the purpose and don't collect more than you need. So if you're collecting information from me to invite me to a webinar, don't ask me for my ID number. Don't ask me for my bank account details. Why do you need it? it, it one, you don't need it. And so it doesn't become lawful. Two, it actually puts you in a position where you're at risk because if any data, you have to take additional security measures to protect that data. And if there's a leak, you're in a, you're, you might be in trouble because why, why do you have bank account details when all you said you were going to do in the purpose was, you know, to send webinar details? 
over here at number two comes what I think is the most important aspect of copy and it is consent. So up, down, left, right, no matter what happens, if you have consent, you are good to go. So there will be, you know, if, if you come to me and you say, it's for a webinar, but I want your bank account details anyway, because I think it might be necessary, but it's not really necessary for this purpose, but I want it. And I look at you and I'm like, you know what? It's fine. Like, like you've used my information before. I trust you. I, I, you might come up with a good product for me. Who knows? Here's my bank account details. I'm okay with the fact that you're, that you're collecting it and storing it on your laptop that isn't password protected. It's fine. You can go ahead and do it. Get my written consent and you can do whatever you want um, with my personal information. Obviously within reason, you can't do anything illegal. Um, but that is, that is where a lot of people tend to focus when it comes to compliance um, and that focus is, is consent. If you don't have consent, there are still ways in which you can process information, but you will need to be able to justify why you're allowed to do it. So um, maybe you're processing the information because it's, um, it's a question of somebody else's safety. Uh, you know, you've got criminal information about me and, you know, I'm a, I'm a kidnapper and I kidnap people all the time and you know this and you, my neighbor's daughter's kidnapped and, and you share that information, you know, you, you've gone and processed it. I haven't consented. It's quite sensitive but you had a really good reason for sharing it. Um, you know, those are kind of, it's, it's a value judgment that you make as you process, especially if you don't have consent. Um, the third one, which I've touched on is purpose specification. So the purpose for which the personal information is collected must be specific, specific, explicitly defined and lawful. So lawful, we've, we've talked about uh, specific and explicitly defined. Again, when you're collecting personal information, you cannot collect it for one reason and then use it for another reason. You could, but if you do it, you would be falling afoul of the provisions of copy. So you don't, you don't want that to happen. Um, the best way to deal with purpose specification here is to give the data subjects as much information as possible. Um, practical consideration that a lot of people have been doing and that we've been advising our clients to do is to send, you know, if you've already got all this information and if you're using it in a way that you, you know, that you're not sure um, falls within the ambit of copy and, and the purpose of collection and so on, is you put up a privacy policy on your website and or you send a notification to data subjects whose information that you're processing, um, just letting them know that either in the privacy policy or via the notification, a lot of people are doing both. Um, that this is the information that we have, this is what we're using for, uh, using it for, this is how we store it, if you want us to delete it, X, Y, Z, you kind of spell that out for them. And then boom, suddenly they know about it and um, you're one step closer to full compliance with copy. So it really is a practical thing. And when you're, when you're going through this, my strong suggestion to everyone is to, if you can, read the act and if all you read are the eight conditions for processing good for you because there's a lot of information here you're never going to be able to cover it in a presentation um you'd need more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of session but it's very important to know and very important to understand um how these how these provisions and how these conditions work so number four is the further processing limitation um Further processing happens once you know you've already you've already done the first batch of processing and now you want to do something different with it. So in this case, um, the first step of processing information here was when you know when you signed up for the webinar and you provided your details to Printing SA and they collected that information. So that information was was processed and it was processed with your consent and you knew why it was processed. So you know you can see at least that the first three steps there have been followed. Now there's the further processing of information. Um, Megan put up a poll, and in that poll, I think it asked whether you know whether you wanted to be contacted. Now, should should you click yes, and should those details then be shared with me? That information has been further processed, so it deviates from the original process and the original purpose, which was just to attend the webinar, to now being contacted. It's being done with your consent, obviously. So 
there's no limitation and we're good to go. But that is an example of what further processing is. Um, the limitation here is that it must always be compatible with the purpose for which the information is collected. So again, in this case, it would be because you've consented, you know the purpose, um, and it all ties together really nicely. Number five is, is one of my favorites because it's short and simple. Information quality needs to be high. You need to take reasonably practicable steps to ensure that personal information is complete, accurate, not misleading, updated and processed for the stated purpose. You will get tired of hearing words like consent and stated, stated purpose by the end of this presentation. And I'm sorry, I wish I could hear you all laughing because I know I'm really funny, but seriously, stated purpose is your number two, consent is your number one, always keep that in mind. Take these steps um, to ensure that information is complete, accurate, not misleading. So here it's important, um, not necessarily with, again, something like a phone number, but it is important um, when you're looking, for example, at my medical history, your discovery, you need to make sure that that's accurate because, or you're a doctor, um, you need to make sure that my record, my patient records are accurate because if I drop dead tomorrow, I don't want um, discovery trying to renege on my life policy and saying that your medical records weren't properly up to date or your doctor didn't share this or share that. So those are the kinds of reasons that it's important to keep your information off the of the highest quality. Um, uh, practically speaking, how this will translate into real life, uh, we're not sure yet because Poppy hasn't been tested. Um, but the best, I think the best way to do this is to just treat the information as sensitively as possible and, and keep it in as much as organized as you can possibly keep it. Um, number six is openness. This is also fairly important. Um, probably one of the second most important one after the ones that relate to consent. Um, openness needs you to notify the data subjects of certain aspects related to the processing of personal information, including why it's collected, the purpose of collection, and how it will be used. Again, you'll see they all speak to each other. They're very interrelated. As much as they're eight conditions, it's really just one one umbrella kind of provision that tells you how you need to treat information. Like I said earlier, this, we've got clients that are sending out notices and drafting privacy policies that are published on their websites that contain all of the information that Poppy requires it to contain, just so that they can't be accused of, um, you know, of not being open on data subjects can't come to you and go, you're being shady because, uh, because that's that's kind of where murkiness starts to happen. If if you're not open with your data subjects, uh, you know, or if you know, if the information isn't readily available, it's not on your website. You've just spoken to someone; they don't they don't know what's going on, and they find find out a year down the line that you've been secretly collecting I don't know some kind of additional data when they, all they thought you, was that you were collecting their phone numbers for webinars, and now suddenly. Oh, email address for webinars and suddenly they realize you've been collecting their browser history or something along those lines that becomes a problem um it's why when you've got websites you want cookie notifications um you probably also want a cookie policy in your privacy policy if you're going to have one um google analytics stuff like that you just again you just want to be open about it this isn't don't, don't panic. This isn't about pe getting people into trouble. It's just getting people into line. It's about creating this transparent kind of data society where we all know how our personal data is being treated and that it can't be used in a way that we haven't consented to. Um, and the reason for that is genuinely protecting the rights to privacy. Data is one of the most powerful tools in the world. I don't need to tell most of you that because your businesses run off it with our data the the market as we know it would probably collapse so that's really that's really what you're going for when we're saying be open when we're saying take all these steps do the notices do the privacy policies it's just to make sure that those those goals and those visions come to life number seven security safeguards this is these are the steps that you need to take to make sure that um the personal information is processed securely. It's the most important step when it comes to data breaches because, you know, if you've got 
bank account details on a laptop that isn't password protected that you use at the, the bootleggers down the road and, and you leave your laptop open and go to the bathroom and there's a breach because somebody comes and picks your laptop up and just takes it away. You're going to be in a lot of trouble, not just from a practical perspective, but under Poppy. And that's what Poppy has kind of done. It's put into place the fact that you need to take measures to secure data. Um, again, phone number, you know, you want to keep things password protected at a minimum. So if, if you're if you don't have that done, get that, get that in order. But the way you deal with security safeguards is again in a very pragmatic way you don't want to be spending millions of friends just to protect cell phone numbers and email addresses the more money the more sensitive the data is that you're holding i.e the more harm it could cause if there's a data breach the more security safeguards you're going to need to take it, it's it's murky and this is why you'll see later on we we the act requires an impact assessment to be done and it's something that we have helped a lot of clients with it's because you need to kind of know what data do you have how risky is it do you need to take more steps to protect it um are you doing enough because if there's a data breach and you haven't done enough and harm's been suffered that i think is the point that you should start panicking if not now um the last one is data subject participation so the data subject has the right to request the information that it has be deleted to ask you questions about how you're using that information um to if it's provided consent for you to use it in a particular way to withdraw the consent um Again, privacy policy here is very useful. You just publish it on your website. If somebody wants to know how the information is being treated, how they um, need to, how they want to get it deleted, just all the information that they could possibly need. That's the stuff that gets included in your privacy policy. It's on your website. And then for the most part, as long as you're following the rest of these, um, the rest of these conditions, you'll be okay. Now, this is special personal information and it's another category. People find it annoying because there's just so much but special personal information um is the religious or philosophical beliefs race or ethnic origin trade union membership political persuasion health or sex life or biometric information of a data subject as well as information related to a data subjects criminal activities even if it's you know it's just allegedly and it hasn't been proven um that all constitutes special personal information and special personal information can't be processed unless certain requirements are met um you'll need consent from the data subject again like i said consent is your number one and it's most people's dreams come true um under poppy so you'll need consent from the data subject to process this information which you've already been providing if you've ever gone you know if you've ever gone to for a blood test you sign those forms and you give consent so that's kind of you know just carries on from that um or very good reason as to why you're processing the information so for example you're doing you're doing research um, or statistical, or you need to keep an eye on your on your BE score. So you you know you need to know your your employees' races and so on um, to process it. I'm not going to focus on special personal information because it is very, as you can see, it's very delineated. It's not everything. If you are processing special personal information and you're concerned and you need specific advice, please just contact us. We'll be able to answer your questions. Um, but for now, I'm not going to dwell here because I don't think most people do this. Direct marketing, this excites people a lot. Um, so direct marketing is, is a blanket prohibition on direct marketing under Poppy. It makes business people really upset when they hear this, but it is what it is. So there's a blanket provision. In fact, the reason Poppy, so you'll see the Poppy Act, um, was promulgated in 2013 and it's seven years later that people now have to become compliant and the bulk of that reason is because people were lobbying about direct marketing um and yeah this was this was the biggest deal and it upsets the most people so direct marketing is generally prohibited um and there are two different types there are two different types of direct marketing and, and the act distinguishes between them and there's different rules so there's electronic direct marketing and there's other forms of direct marketing which will be your telemarketing, going door to door, putting people at robots, handing out pamphlets, sticking pamphlets on cars and so on. So those are the other forms. Um, the one that 
has the most rules is electronic direct marketing. It is any form of electronic communication, including automatic calling machines, fax machines, SMSs, or emails. Um, so you know those those call those calls that you get where you press it and you're like hello and they go hello you have been selected those things that is um that's electronic direct marketing very specifically telemarketing isn't included in this telemarketing has different rules they have lighter rules so the more stringent rules are for electronic direct marketing um so when it comes to electronic direct marketing, you need to obtain their consent to, um, to direct market to them. You can only approach them once if they don't consent. So if you come to me and you're like, can I, can I send you these emails? And I say flat out, no, you're not actually allowed to ask me again in terms of the act. Um, I don't think you're going to go to jail or get a huge fine if you do it. But if, you know, if, if it builds up and if it happens too often, then you might get into a little bit of trouble with the regulator. We're not sure how that's going to work yet, um, but that is what it is. Consent must be given in the prescribed form. Um, for now, all you need to know is that it needs to be in writing and it needs to be informed. They need to like click the button on the pop-up or they need to sign the piece of paper or whatever the case is, it must be in writing. Keep records of that, hey, like if you are direct marketing and somebody consents, whether it's online, whether it's by physically filling out a form, you hang on to those because they're gold because that's your consent. Um, you're also allowed to do this where the uh, data subject is your customer. So you can approach an existing customer, uh, whether it's an old customer that you haven't, if there's no time limit, the act doesn't Put in a time limit so it can be an old customer from 10 20 30 years ago or a more recent customer somebody that's bought from you in the past week um without their consent if you are selling them a product or service similar to the one that you previously sold to them so if you previously sold them a printer and you now want to go and say that i will sell you printing ink makes sense you can direct market to them um and yeah so that's electronic direct marketing with other marketing you can reach out to data subjects, make sure you have the information lawfully. Like I said, don't hack data cell phone numbers um, unless they opt out. So if you call someone and they say, take me off your list, I'm tired of hearing from you, you take them off, you take them off your list and you don't call them again unless they consent to being called. Um, all direct marketing must contain the sender's details and opt out information. Those are the two things. Um, and when you're gaining consent and so on, the, the purpose for which you're doing it must be clear. There is a prescribed form. It's under regulation four of the property rules, but we don't, it doesn't need to be that form um, verbatim. So, you, you know, just make sure that it's in writing, make sure it contains the sender's details, opt out information um, and the purpose for which you're collecting the information. So here's the exciting part because you've got a one July deadline. The first thing you need to do is register an information officer and deputy information officer. There's a bit of back and forth about whether deputy information officer is necessary. So it, it just depends on how you want to deal with it. Bigger companies, I would genuinely suggest that you get a deputy information officer or two because you're going to need help. Um, but your first step, do this before the 1st of July, just go onto the regulator's website. It, will help you if you need help. Register an information officer. The information officer must be a, must either be the head of the department or he must sign an authorization letter confirming that you can, uh, appointing somebody else as the information officer. That person must be in the employ of the company and it must be somebody more senior who has oversight. So that's really step one, register your information officer. We can help you with it. Um, you can do it yourself. Uh, just start there. The next step is that this information officer must conduct an impact assessment just to see how compliant you are with Poppy and to take the steps where necessary to comply. Impact assessment um, is something that, you know, that again, we can help with. We can, we can get you an impact assessment questionnaire, which you then just use to kind of fill in, you know, you know, it's like, how is this information being collected? How is it being stored? What is the purpose? And then you just have all of this in front of you and you go, this seems to comply, this doesn't seem to comply. 
with bigger companies or where we know companies are dealing with sensitive information, we encourage them to come to us so that we can give you feedback um, because you know you you might not necessarily know the steps to take to be poppy compliant but if you're processing bank account information um and this is just banking details and so on and a lot of businesses do that you need to make sure that you're compliant so where you're uncertain about your compliance do the impact assessment and then give that impact assessment it doesn't have to be to us just to somebody who understands poppy um just to give you feedback on whether you are compliant the third one is that you should publish a privacy profile on your website. Uh, this, like I said, will ensure that data subjects have easy access to the information that they need. Uh, you don't have to, but it is highly recommended. Um, there's no reason not to, unless you're a very small entity and you're, you know, you've got very minimal information that you're processing. But even then, even if it's not a privacy policy, just publish a notice on your website going, this is us. Um, the fourth one is an internal compliance framework, so uh, which includes a security compromise plan or steps that you take if there have been if there might have been a data breach. This is important where there are a number of employees because it's quite it's quite difficult to kind of just sit down today and say to everyone we need you to do this. You know that you need to have guidelines and frameworks in place for employees to be able to comply. So it's not for everyone. Certainly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell tiny companies to do this. I wouldn't tell companies with two employees to do this. Um, but it's worth having. It, it's definitely worth having because it just keeps you in line. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a checklist where you can refer to it and go, okay, cool, this makes sense. Um, or we've got new information. What do we need to do now? Our compliance framework tells you that. If, you know, if, we, if we've changed the purpose, if there's if there's a further purpose to processing, we've got to do this. If there might be a data breach, we've got to do that, that, and that. And it just kind of sets it out there so that you don't have to think about it again. You can always refer back to it to make sure that you're compliant. The fifth one is notices to data subjects, amendments to contracts with employees and third parties. This is just really kind of like a catch-all. Are you compliant? Are you not compliant? The notices to, to the data subjects are... Um, they would kind of be standardized and you just send them out to everyone telling them that this is what you're doing so that no one can actually argue and say that you never told them. Then there's amendments to contracts with employees and third parties. Again, this just involves you putting in standardized clauses. Either you amend the existing contracts or you only do it from the new ones going forward and you send notices in respect of the existing ones, but you just put everything in there to make sure that it's poppy compliant. Probably the most important one here is making sure that your employment contracts are in order because um, as the information officer as the head and as the head of the company, if there's a data breach and you know if, if it wasn't in your employee's employment contract and there's no internal compliance framework and they haven't been communicated with and they make a mistake and you're in trouble, you'll be in trouble and they can't be held responsible for that because you never communicated it to them. It was never in the contract. So just, you know, just be aware of that. Um, you may need a PIA manual. If, if you're a smaller business, and I spoke to Abisha and he mentioned, you know, largely SMMEs here, um, you probably don't need a PIA manual. You are likely exempt. But if you've got more than 50 employees or if you've got turnover going to the millions and then in certain specific sectors like construction and engineering and so on, um, then you'll need a PIA manual. Again, if you're not sure, reach out to us or reach out to somebody, you know, somebody else that you trust, look it up. It's, it's easy to access information on the Googles. Um, just to see if you actually do need one, but for most most companies at this stage in, in South Africa don't. Okay, so the responsibilities of the information officer. Uh, you, you know, like I said, you need to register this information officer ASAP by the 1st of July, and that information officer has certain responsibilities. Um, in terms of the act, you know, you've got to deal with requests made in terms requests made in terms of the act, so a request to delete information or a request to tell you why that information is being shared. Um, encourage compliance with the conditions. Work with the regulator if there's investigations. Um, you also need to develop a compliance framework. Now, again. A compliance framework is just an internal document. You don't need lawyers to prepare it for you. It's just a good to have thing. You're not going to go to jail if you don't have one developed, but 
but it's it's great to have it. Um, adequate measures to comply with the conditions for lawful processing. So you, the information officer, need to go to the company and say, we need to make sure that we've got two-factor authentication because we're processing very sensitive information here. Um, or our password, our password symptom, uh, our password system's not complex enough, we need to up it. Um, you need to do preliminary assessments, that's your impact assessment. Um, and up, you need to develop a PIA manual if your company is not exempt from PIA. Uh, and you should be conducting awareness sessions with your employees just so that they know what the act is about. Uh, this is the one that scares people the most. It's the penalties for non-compliance. Um, the information regulator here can basically issue a notice telling you that you need to comply with Buffy, um, slap you with a fine, send you to jail, and the data subjects can sue you if you know, if you've breached the provisions of prop puppy and it suffered harm as a result. So if you've got my banking information and it's leaked and there's been fraud and now I have not a penny, um, I can sue you to recover that money. It's not the bank's fault. It's not my fault. You breached the terms of puppy, so I could sue you for that. Um, yeah, these are, these are the, you know, the, at a more detailed level, what the what the penalties would be. So you could go to jail for 10 years if the information regulator sends you a notice and says you need to comply and you don't. Um, again, don't panic because you haven't received that notice yet. The, the way I think the whole puppy enforcement is going to play out is that if somebody, the information, somebody reports you to the information regulator who decides that you're not compliant and then the information regulator comes to you and says you need to comply and you'll be in trouble if you don't. Not, not so much so when there's a data breach, harm does come there, but you know you just need to be aware um, that there will be penalties for non-compliance. Keep saying it, don't panic. Register your information officer by the 1st of July. Don't panic. Um, there are penalties for non-compliance, but if, you know, if you're processing benign data, if it's low risk, even if there's a data breach, harm will be low. So don't go and spend millions just trying to become poppy compliant when all you're doing is storing names and phone numbers. Um, be quick and stressed out if you're processing high risk information um, and get legal advice because if you're not sure what you're doing and there is a data breach, then that is that is the highest risk area when it comes to poppy. Read the act. Um, we'll send we'll send through a copy and that can be circulated. Um, but but definitely read the act and read those conditions for processing. It's not long. Unlike all the old statutes, poppy is actually quite easy to read. As soon as you wrap your head around the definitions of who's who and what's what, you'll be able to get through it easily and. May if, if you don't want to come to us and you, if you're developing a compliance framework, use those eight conditions, use the act and just put something together for yourself. Um, do the impact assessment because you need to know where your risk lies. You need to know if you're low risk, medium risk, high risk, how much of trouble could you get into if there's a data breach, how much of harm. Um, do that assessment so you know. And the last one is just make sure that the data you're processing at the moment is as secure as possible. Just be reasonable about it. Again, don't spend millions protecting somebody's name, but definitely spend as much money as you can afford where if that information is leaked, there'll be significant harm. And that's it. Uh, it's a lot of information to cover. I probably haven't covered everything that would be of importance to you specifically, but it's just the nature. Poppy advice is different for everyone. It's question time. So. Hi, uh, well, well th thanks for that, Safi. Um, it's really insightful information, and uh, you keep saying don't panic. I've been panicking all through your presentation. So, yeah. Um, but perhaps, yes, we could look some, at some of the questions from the attendees. Um, perhaps the first question from Mr. Johan Barnard, Safi. Um, he says the registration of an officer is a problem. You can only register for one entity. If you are responsible for more entities, the system says your ID has been used. That's true. So that's a problem with the system at the moment. It's um, it's it's something that we've come across ourselves because we've been assisting with, with registrations. We aren't sure how it's going to be overcome. I think for the time being, 
um, what we've been doing is telling people to write to the regulator and let them know. The, the one thing though, is that I will tell you is that if you are the head of the company, even if you are not necessarily registered on the website, you are automatically considered the information officer. So even if you don't fill in that form, it will be automatic. It's just um, particularly if you want to authorize someone else to do it, that is when you go onto the website and you register. But register either way, um, just, yeah, there is this glitch, unfortunately. Uh, how many deputy information officers is one allowed to register? You are allowed to have as many deputy information officers as you like. They'll be designated um, by form. So if you've got a business with 1,000 employees and 25 departments, I would say I have 25 deputy information officers, one for each department, and then one that sits at the top that's ultimately in charge. Um, the, there has been a guidance note that was published in April, which says that everyone must have at least one deputy information officer. Again, it's that's not the law. It's just what the guidance note says. And um, there we go. Um, yeah, it's just what the guidance note says, but we take it from there. It's encouraged at this stage, but it's not people aren't doing it. Um, another question from Dion Bear. Please elaborate on the rules for printed direct marketing. Example, door drops, mail, brochures, and et cetera. So though that does, so that kind of direct marketing doesn't contain any personal information usually, right? It's just, it's, it's whoever's paying you. So it'll be printing a say, contact us for this, contact us for that. And you just, you just drop it around. You're not processing any kind of personal information in doing it. Um, and so it would fall outside of the ambit of copy unless for some reason, personal information is involved. All right. Um, Craig has asked, um, if we send a notification to a data subject, do they have to send confirmation or consent in order for it to comply? So it depends on the kind of notice that's being sent. If you're sending a request for consent to direct market, yes. Um, if you if you believe you already had the consent, um, if you've already got this information, then no, they don't need to respond to you. You just need to, it's super practical. You just need to make sure that you have done enough to, to be able to say, we sent them this notice. Here's the stuff, it's on our website. We tried our best. We sent an SMS on top of it. Um, and then use your, use your discretion because like I said, you don't wanna be doing all of this for phone numbers, but, but as you go along, you, you need to make that call as to whether you've done enough. It'll depend on each case. It does seem very onerous though. It, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like it is. And I think part of the reason for that is that it hasn't been tested yet. So we don't actually know how it's going to be enforced. And we don't know, you know, if this thing goes to court. Because right now we're saying, well, if it's phone numbers, it'll be okay. Like you just, the steps you need to take are less. And if it's something, you know, if it's a bank account, then it's more serious. But it might eventually go to court and the court might not take that practical approach. Now that's unlikely, but until such time as it's been tested, um, all the regulations apply to everything. And, and you've got to just be very careful and very practical about how you treat it. Okay. And how would you handle a telephone call for a reference, uh, Safi? So someone phones you about a reference for a job? Uh, phones in what context? So. It's, so is it a for confirmation future employer? Employment. Yes, for confirmation of employment. So there you would likely just find out from this person if they have the consent of the party. Uh, so you know, if I'm applying for the job at, a, at another law firm and that law firm contacts Gunstons, um, Gunstons asks, did Safi give you consent to contact me? And if you're nervous about it, if you know, if you're sharing, if you're not, if you're sharing something other than she's the best lawyer in the world. Um, then I would suggest that, you know, yeah, I would suggest that you, that you find out from, from Safi whether, whether you're allowed to share information with this party. All right. Um, and I take it the, the, the act applies to schools, universities, everybody. Yeah. It applies to everyone. It doesn't apply to public bodies. So it won't apply to state departments. Okay. Um, as printers, we store artwork. So Andres asked the question, as printers, we store artwork with templates for clients. What yeah. are our responsibilities towards storing this? So again, it depends on what kind of personal information is, is in that template. If it's, it, 
you know, I, I'm looking at the background behind you. It says Printing SA, Federation of Printing, Packaging, Signage, and Visual Communication. That is not personal information in any way. Um, so that's number one. If it does contain personal information, just make sure that you've got consent for it, that, um, you know, I'm storing printing essays information, they know that I'm storing it. It's usually a symbiotic relationship. It's a customer that has given you that information voluntarily, and that takes care of the consent requirements. Okay. Um, just a question from Judy. Many email direct marketing do not have an uns unsubscribe tab, but direct you to an email address to unsubscribe, which is never adhered to. What's the position of that? So <laughs> the app doesn't specifically say you need an unsubscribe tab. It, it just says that, you know, people need to be able to easily opt out as long as, as long as it's, sorry about this, as long as it's um, working, as long as they can click a link, as long as it's easy for them to do, there shouldn't be a problem, but it, they shouldn't have to jump through 20 hoops to unsubscribe if all they have to do to subscribe was click a button, it must be equal. So if all you have to do is put in your email address to subscribe, that's all you should need to do to unsubscribe. Just keep it, keep it equal. Um, okay. I have a question from Abdul Majid. Cybersecurity and hacking is a real problem. If the company website gets hacked, even with a firewall and other measures in place, and member information gets leaked or customer information, how will, this, how will the regulator deal with this if your company has a database of 500 as opposed to another company with 5,000 on its database? So it's not necessarily the size of the database or so on. Um, what happens if there's a data breach, whether it's a big data breach or if it's one person's telephone number versus a million person's bank accounts details, you need to, you need to treat it in the same way as in you give notice of that to the regulator and then you ask them for direction on what to do, you might need to also give notice to the data subject saying that you're, that, um, you know, that there's been a breach. Following on from that, there will be an assessment, you know, if there's harm that's been suffered, the regulator will tell you what to do. Uh, and if there has been harm, and if it's found out that, you know, that you didn't actually take enough steps to protect this information, there could be civil liability. But if you have taken all the steps, and, you know, when Facebook gets hacked, that's the level of skill that some hackers have. And if you've done everything that you could do, or if you've acted reasonably to protect this information, you're good to go. All right. Um, in terms of cookies on websites, um, yeah. does the act have anything to do with that? So the act doesn't expressly deal with cookies, but cookies can contain personal information. And in that case, the where the cookies contain personal information, they will um, it will fall within the ambit of the act. Um, you need to delineate between your, what I call your standard, I'm not too familiar with the terms, but I call them your standard cookies, um, the ones that end when you end session on the browser and they get deleted immediately and they don't really have any information about you against cookies that actually store your personal information. So if you go onto the website and if you log in, um, let's just say like take a lot, you, you log in, you've, it's got your name, it's got your details, it's got your purchase history, it might even have your bank card details. Um, and those are stored on cookies. Those cookies are personal information. So have your cookie policy up on the website um, in your privacy policy if you are collecting personal information using your cookie. And sorry, just to, just to confirm that your standard cookies, like if you've got a standard cookie, you don't know, you won't be able to look at that cookie and go, that's the person. But if you've got these the cookie with personal information and if you yeah. look at the cookie, then it's like, cool, that, that was from Safi. And that is the cookie that you need to be more concerned about, not the person. All right. Um, Safi, we've got some uh, printers who print for print brokers and ad agencies where the client and the actual printing are not the same people. If, if, if we have permission from the broker, is that sufficient? It will depend. So in this case, the broker will be the responsible party and you will be the operator. So as an operator, you will act in accordance with a contract or a mandate. The broker comes to you, it says, I'm giving you this information printed. What you should try and do in those cases is get confirmation from the written confirmation from the broker that they have complied with copy, just so that you have it for your own records. But ultimately the responsibility vests with the broker. So if the broker wasn't supposed to share that with you, 
that's the broker's problem. You will still need to take care of that information. You will need to store it properly, delete it properly, not hold onto it for any longer than necessary. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to take one last question, uh, Sabi. Um, where can the impact, the impact access form, the internal compliance framework, security compliance, security compliance plan, an amendment to contracts, notice to data subject be downloaded? So, so those things are so those things either you prepare yourself or you have somebody assist you in preparing it. Um, we have, we've got our own, um, we've got our own forms that we use and then we tailor them to your needs if you want to tailor the bespoke version. Um, and then we've got simpler forms for smaller businesses or for people who deal with less sensitive information. Um, but certainly they can be put together yourselves. The, I would again direct you to the Poppy Act and I will send that um, through to you guys that we go through these conditions and you just kind of do like a box ticking exercise. You're like, do I have consent? Am I getting this information from the right person? Just go through that step by step. Alternatively, you know, you can come to us or you can go to another law firm or any other kind of copy experts will be able to help you put that together. All right. Well, thank you very much for all of that information, Safi. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you once again to yourself, some Gunston Sadwick attorneys for such a comprehensive overview on what we should be doing in order to comply with the Poppy Act, uh, it is, as it is greatly appreciated, not only by Planting SA, but I'm sure also by the audience, uh, where we've all gained some great insights. As always, thank you again to Africa Print. We appreciate your continued support in assisting us to host these events in order to keep our industry informed. Please look out for communication on our next session, which we will be looking at the energy performance certification that will be taking place in about two weeks' time. Um, we will be sharing the webinar with all of the participants or all of the attendees um, and try to answer as many of the other questions which we're not able to answer. Thank you once again to everybody for your attendance. Have a great weekend. Keep your masks on and stay safe. Thank you very much.